I remember the words of my art teacher saying, nobody makes money out of art. It does make me smile now. I was on Top Gear and the Times, I was on Brazilian TV news. It was crazy. That increases demand on the paintings. I'd have never had an idea. That I didn't realize how much scope there was. I think it's because I didn't go to art college is why I make a decent living out of it. There are far better artists than me out there. It's just you don't know who they are. I lost my job. Um, that was my dream job. You often never see the next big thing until it's right in front of you. I was commissioned by Chelsea Football Club. I literally had five days to paint 11 faces. Normally that'll be a month's work. I had a couple of big gallery shows which sold out. If you sell the gallery show out, you're too cheap. It must have sold to other people in the motorsport world. It's a pinch me moment. The first big pinch me were I'm not fibbing when I say I've really been excited for this week's episode because when I get guests on where the subject matter we're talking about is something that I really don't know a lot about, I absolutely love it because I love learning, I love hearing new things, and I love hearing interesting stories. No doubt lots of people will be here because they'd have come from your own socials, they'll already know who you are, they may even have a piece of your artwork hung up in their home. However, I always ask my guests this question, I love hearing the response. Paul, in your own words, who are you and what do you do? Uh, so, yeah, well, thanks for having me first off. So it's uh, good to be doing this finally. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm Paul Oz. Uh, fundamentally, I'm a motorsport artist uh, in oil paint and bronze. Um, how that came to pass is a little bit more uh, of a story, but, um, you know, I'm sure we'll Sure, we'll get to that bit. That's what I'd like to do. To really understand a person, I find it always helps to find out what their upbringing was like. What did life look like when you were younger? Did you always love art at school? And that kind of helps us to discover where you've got to today and figure out a little bit more on that journey. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can always remember drawing as a kid uh, from probably, well, certainly age five. I've actually got a, uh, I made a, collage of some parrots when I was five, which I won a prize for. So it was obviously there early on. Um, and all the way through primary and secondary school, I can remember drawing a lot. Um, I love drawing, painting, even at home. Um, at 16, uh, I wanted to go to art college. Um, but the simple fact is that I was uh, grade C in art and I was A's in maths and physics. So the sensible career advice was, no, no, you, you, you have a proper job. You, you've got a career ahead of you um, somewhere where you can make proper money rather than something vocational, which is unreliable. And I remember the words of my art teacher saying, nobody makes money out of art, um, which is, uh, it does make me smile now. Um, uh as a fact, I looked it up, only 10% of art school graduates actually make a career out of art in the end. Yeah. And only 1% end up making a career in the higher earners as yeah. well of the UK. So you did that without actually going well, to art college then. You, you say taking that a bit further, I think it's because I didn't go to art college is why I make a decent living out of it. Um, because fundamentally, the, the the most important thing about a career in art isn't actually the art. Okay, the art's got to stand up to it, but it's how how to talk to people, how how to uh, promote yourself, because you can't always rely on other people to promote you. Um, it, it's the whole story of how you construct the business is the most important thing. There are there are far better artists than me out there. It's just you don't know who they are because they don't know how to talk to people. They don't know how to promote themselves. They don't know how to get promoted. They don't know how to work with multinational corporations. Moving out on even further, to work with an F1 team like I do weekly, the amount of awareness you have to have of the uh, commercial situation, the political landscape, the sport, it, it, it's a minefield. Um, and if I'd gone straight to art college at 16, I don't think I'd know any of that. So you mentioned to make a business out of art, you obviously have to sell a piece or sell something. Yeah. What was your first sale growing up? Do you remember it? Uh, so I, because at 16, I then ended up studying uh, 
maths and physics. And then I went to university and studied aerospace engineering. Uh, I then went into business and industry, and I didn't actually start painting until I was uh, nearly 30. Um, and then I thought I'd literally be moved into a plain white, plain white new build, build flat. I thought, right, I need to put something on the walls. Started looking around art galleries. I remember saying to my girlfriend at the time, oh, I, I can do that. And she's like, what? Are you sh what? No, you can't. Said, All right, fine. So I bought some paints um purely to create artwork for the walls of our flat is how it started and these are oil paints uh this was acrylic back then acrylic um but i think it i think it probably was only the second or third piece that i created that i sold to a mate um and yeah might have only been a couple hundred quid but I was, it's not bad for a first sale no, actually but, yeah but but uh, the instant thought was oh this is a decent bit of beer money you know, when, when you, when you work in nine to five and, you know, at the end of every month you've got, you know, if you're lucky, you've got a quid left in your bank. Yeah. We, we, we were all like that. And you um, mentioned you were 30 at that age. So what yeah. were you, what were you doing for a living? Uh, at that point I was a, uh, sales, area sales manager for a clutch company, the biggest clutch company in the world. Um, so I'd been with that company 10 years, but I started off in, uh, customer service, then IT then middle management in a uh, customer service office. And then I blagged my way out into the field sales team. Um, the field sales team is probably most responsible for my attitude, especially to working with people. Um, because yeah, you, know, you learn so much about not just communication, but um, yeah, perception and markets and import and export and, Again, it's all stuff that I use every day. So you think that, as you said before, to actually make a business out of art, you need to understand all the pieces of the puzzle that go around it, not just the piece that you've created in the center to actually make a business out of it. Do you think if you didn't work in that industry for that 10 years, then you'd be as successful as you are now in your art? No chance. Ab absolutely no chance. I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have known how to build a business. I wouldn't know. I mean, they're hesitating to use technical sales world words like sales funnels and stuff because uh i don't do that not not physically maybe in my head um but the whole concept of how to build a sales pipeline and how to uh, how to convert it without pushing too hard the, the the biggest thing that turns people off with art is artists that push categorically the worst thing that artists can do is offer something for sale Instantly you do that, nobody wants it. It has to be the other person's idea. Oh, can I buy that? And it's it it's not that difficult uh, a switch to make. You just have to pretend you you don't want to sell something. Um, but again, I wouldn't know any of this. Or sell good. less than the demand. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that that's a, that's another thing as well. You know. Um, um, but, but, but fundamentally, the harder you try to sell something in art is the least likely you are going to sell it. And on the weekends and during that period of time you worked for that company and even that bit growing up, you mentioned the first thing that you ever doodled was a parrot. So you clearly wanted to draw animals for argument's yeah. sake. What were some of your other passions during that 10 year space? Was motorsport always at the front or was it spread across a variety of sports? Um, like myself, I like variety of sports. Uh... For other sports, no, it was only motorsport. Um, I can remember drawing in pencil Kankanen's 205 uh, and remembering the bedroom I was in. I must have been under eight when I was drawing that. Um, I used to draw trees a lot. I used to draw um, trains coming out of tunnels, that sort of thing. Uh, I remember drawing a basket of fruit quite photorealistically. This is a funny thing. I used to used to be able to pencil draw photorealistically. Um, I'm fairly sure I can't do it anymore because I, well, I haven't tried. But um, I actually read on your website because I do my research before yeah. we get going that you've had the same paddle which you put yeah. with for the, over ten years the palette, now. Same palette knife, yeah. Palette knife. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. that's the piece of um, Yeah, it's because uh, when you buy a palette knife, they're actually quite stiff. Um, and I've been using predominantly one pattern knife for 10 years. It's got the flexibility of a piece of thin card now. 
And it's not um, like Trigger's Broom. It's not had like seven different tops and four no, different models. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's been re-welded twice. Um, it's got so much paint build up on the handle that I don't actually have to physically hold it. It just sits in my hand without holding it. But it's so flexible. I can I can just literally paint paint the circle with a knife in one one wrist movement. It, it's ridiculous. And just for um, reference points, you, we we're talking about kind of how you got to thirty, and that was a kind of critical age for you of finishing in that company, potentially starting your art career. How old are you now? Just for reference, forty-seven now. Oh, so there's been a seventeen-year journey. Yeah, ten of those years you've had this. It, it, yeah, it, exactly <laughs> that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the first uh, few paintings I created in that plain white flat, um, I actually use my company business cards to, to paint with. Um, I thought it was a bit of a, a yeah, <laughs> a bit, bit of irony. Um, and then it, it, it was a, it was a part-time hobby for, uh, I think three or three or four years. Um, and at that point I was then working for a central London software firm. And then when the world collapsed in 2008, 2009, uh, I lost my job. Um, that was my dream job working for central London uh, software firm offices in Covent Garden. Uh, fairly decent salary, uh, huge bonuses. Uh, and then I suddenly dropped on my ass and, uh, you know, I had enough money in the bank to, to live on for a couple of weeks, but that was it. Um, and the turning point was, well, it wasn't a turning point. It was, I was forced into it. it was, I've got no money. How do I get money? Uh, I need to paint something. And had you been learning, you mentioned earlier about beer money, basically, when you sold yeah. your first piece. Yeah. Had you continued to do that on the side? Away from that. Yes. Yeah. So um, for those four years, I painted um, as a hobby and as beer money. Uh, it, it wasn't just because I wanted to paint. I did want to earn money from it. Um, I had a few pieces. I managed to get wiggle my way into a local gallery. Um, they sold a few pieces. Nothing, nothing huge. Um, it was literally just a bit of beer money. I think for anybody that... Um, is hearing this story for the first time and discovering Paul, but has any kind of automotive knowledge or have been to Festival of Speed or any type of show, I think the first time I saw something go properly everywhere on social media was the most stunning bronze that had been created of Ayrton Senna going through Rouge. And I have to say, I've never been hugely interested in art. And then I, a few years ago, I started getting really into Banksy and I really enjoy his pieces. But then that for me was the second ever artist I ever was like, took an interest in because of what that piece did when right. I saw it right, yeah. um, at the show. So when did bronzes come into your journey as well as paintings? Um, the, like, like many things, it's kind of um, trusting where the journey takes you. I mean that that's that's another uh, strong belief of mine is not don't push too far, but also trust the plot twists. Um, trust the process. Yeah, um, because you 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 often never see the next big thing until it's right in front of you. Um, yeah, the next big thing could be an hour's time. You you don't know. It's like having an accident. Yeah, you, know, you don't see accidents coming. That's because it's an accident. <laughs> it's exactly the same with, with art. Well, I don't and, know. Me and my twelve years, I could yeah. see an accident coming, so I backed off. Yeah, that's when you should stop. <laughs> um, but uh, so fundamentally, it was so uh, from 2011, I was making F1 component sculptures. So I teamed up with a guy called John Haig, who runs Racing Gold who makes uh, furniture and lamps and things out of repurposed F1 stuff. And I teamed up with him to make a series of F1 sculptures. Um, so part of that fact for a sec. Um, I then have a photographer who captures all of my paintings with a view to be able to print it. It's actually quite a tricky thing to, to capture an oil painting because my paint's so thick. Yeah, to be able to show that texture, to be able to capture that texture and then print it is quite tricky. But anyway, so my photographer then goes, hey, can I show you something that we've been working on? Uh, and it's basically a bank of cameras in a semicircle that if you rotate an item in front of it, it could create a 3D model of it. And then on the back of his studio, so I'm trying to explain this without getting completely lost <laughs> and get everyone else lost, uh, on the back of the studio, happens to be the world's largest and best bronze foundry. 
there are 300 people doing nothing but artistic bronze in a small valley outside Stroud. All the Damien Hurst stuff's made there, for instance. Um, so then I have a tour of the foundry. And I'm thinking, right, so I could take one of my sculptures, um, create a 3D model of it, and then we could make scale versions of it, was my thought, out of these F1 component sculptures. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm just sat at home one night thinking about this. And then it suddenly occurred to me, how was that? No, I could actually make the sculpture out of that 3D model. It could be based on the 3D model. So I then spent the next few weeks running around trying to find Ayrton Senna boots, suit, helmet, gloves. Uh, and then fundamentally, I end up sat on the corner of the boardroom desk in the bronze foundry going, right, we're doing this. And you know, sat, sat on, on my butt doing the driving position of that Senna statue. That, that is literally as organic as it happened. That is absolutely um, incredible. So it's, it's again, it's looking at what you, you have in front of you and right, how, how could that work for me? How can I develop that? And that's my whole mindset with everything I do is like, right, that's interesting. How can I use that? I, I've just been doing the car driving down here. You know, I, uh, you, you, look at, you look at a simple thing and you're like, Ah, what what could I make that's out a of that? Blue sky brain. Yeah, um, I mean that that's the beauty of. Um, I mean, I'm a, a very keen cyclist. I love like mountain biking, especially up in the hills. The headspace that gives you the the disconnect from the outside world. It's something that's nigh impossible these days unless you purposely remove yourself. Um, driving is the same thing. You you drive a car with the radio off. It it's the ultimate headspace. Yeah, you got to put, especially if you're in something that um, takes all of your concentration. And do you find when you're painting then that you almost enter that headspace where there's nothing else coming in other than what you're doing? Or does yeah. it vary? Are you focusing on it that much? Or does it just become naturally that you're just doing it without uh, you even a, knowing? A bit of both. I mean, if, if it's tricky, I really have to concentrate, really have to concentrate, uh, especially tonally. Um, the tones, tones are really difficult to get correct because you're, brain plays tricks on you basically and if you, you look at a cloud you think a cloud's white it's not it's just a paler shade of blue than what's around it just for an example your your brain makes up colors based on what's around it um so when i'm painting from a reference image that's really tricky sometimes to trick you kick your brain out of so that you can paint accurately I think to an outsider, they'd probably think it was easier painting from a reference image than it was. Yeah, well, not. So that's yeah, kind of interesting. Um, yeah, again, your, your brain plays tricks on what color you think you can see, and if you obviously, I've then got to mix that color, so I've got to do it both ways. You got to understand what color you're seeing, but then also reverse engineer that color, and then put it in the right place. <laughs> so I'm keen if we just step it back a second to understand we've mentioned because I couldn't help it because I've just so loved that piece the Earth and Center Brunswick that was only a few years ago right did you debut was, uh, that at Goodwood 2019 uh, Autosport 2019 that was time has flown since yeah, yeah. then yeah. wow that's a little bit further back than I thought it was but yeah. up to that point you'd already become rather successful in the world of your yeah. paintings correct yeah. so that was just a, a, next, yeah, so a next step at, at that point I'd been working with F one for uh, as eight, eight years, probably. Um, and that's a big part of why I had the confidence to do that. Yeah, you know, that center bronze was uh, over a year's work. We were inventing and developing processes as we were working with it, both at my photographers and at the bronze foundry. Um, the investment in that was huge. It, well, fundamentally, it was a year's profit invested a year's profit from the paintings invested into making that bronze that one piece yeah so i had to be pretty freaking confident that it was going to work but because i had by that point i had a relationship with mclaren i had a relationship with the Senna family i ran it past both of them they they both loved the idea um that that's all i need that's all the confidence i need and, and i was confident i had enough uh collectors as well who might be in that price bracket that, that could warrant a, a life-size bronze statue. So you mentioned you had a relationship with McLaren and the Senna factory. Could you just do something like that without having that relationship there? Um, uh, how does it work? So technically, yes. Um, 
uh, for, I mean, it's a very blurry line uh, and it varies country by country, but, uh, but typically uh, for artistic creation, you don't usually need permission from people. Uh, when it becomes muddy is with brands. If I'm painting a sponsor logo, for instance, technically that's copyrighted. Technically. So if there's like Santander on a race suit yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Wow. Technically that's copyrighted. Uh, luckily most, well, luckily at the moment, everyone's been pragmatic about it. Now and again, you have people that uh, um, think they should be earning from what I've created right, okay. off the back of it, which again, isn't strictly isn't true. Um, the one royalties. Yeah. That is, yeah. Isn't it? The, the one angle I have to be extremely careful of is uh, photography. If I use a reference image, I need to pay that photographer licensing to use his reference image, um, which handily with motorsport images is very easy because there's a company called Motorsport Images who bought up most of the world's archives of historic motorsport images. Um, used to be uh, run by Zach Brown. Uh, it, it now isn't, but... Uh, but, but fundamentally, I, I have a very close relationship with the biggest archive of motorsport images in the world, which makes my job easy. And there's so many questions I could ask here because there's just so much to learn about what goes into each individual piece. But I'm already painting a picture, if you excuse the pun, of you've got the piece in front of you and behind it, you have all of the, the things that go with it for argument's sake planning what's actually in the image, who do you need to, really just to get to the point where you could even sell the image. But in terms of time, what sort of time goes into painting an image? Obviously um, it varies, but... Yeah, uh, actually painting it uh, about a week. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I paint fast fundamentally. I mean, look, I'm, I, I spend, as, as you might have already gathered, I, I spend more time on the business side of things networking, um, emailing, running the business than I do painting. I, I probably spend five, six hours a day typing and two or three hours a day creating. Wow. So you, you spread it like that rather than just kind of yeah. getting in the zone and going for yeah. it. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a schedule basically. Um, it's not a hard and fast schedule, but fundamentally I spend, uh, all morning, uh, on the business. So I'll spend all morning on the laptop or meetings or traveling. Um, I'll exercise for a couple of hours at lunchtime and then I'll spend mid afternoon until as, as late as I can creating. And it's actually quite interesting. We are currently at podium place and around us is probably 20 or so pieces spread yeah. around the two different yeah. sides. So that could realistically represent about 20 weeks of your time then. Uh, no, the most, most of them are limited editions. Well, some of them are huge. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, they, yeah, they uh, printed some of the images specifically to fit the space. And I think I may be going home with one. But first of all, <laughs> let me tell you some more about Podium Place. So what is Podium? Podium is an automotive lover's dream. You can see they specialise in coffee. I'm currently at their location just off the M4 at Newbury, which encompasses an amazing automotive themed cafe with supercars on spinning turntables. They also have a detailing company here with one of the best detailers I've ever seen in my life. A detailing brand, you can shop their products online. And not only that, you can come and race against your friends on their state-of-the-art simulators here or even go away with them on a driving tour. To check more out about Podium, check the links in the description of this video. Gosh! So, Paul, I feel like we've already spoken about it. In fact, we started off quite quick. We're getting into the actual business of art and it shows how passionate you are about that side of things as well because I had a whole section on basically the art world because I had right. so many questions yeah. I wanted to ask about that really. But... Everybody is always interested, so we may as well just cover it off straight away in like the cost and the prices of art. Now, obviously, as you mentioned, the first couple of pieces, the, the first piece you did selling for a couple of hundred quid, and then a future piece selling for God knows what, we'll yeah. probably find out shortly. Yeah. But huh. what did that, did was that a very gradual curve throughout your career in terms of values yeah. always going up, or did um, you really see a big gain at a different point of that journey? Uh, it, it's been gradual. It's been gradual. Um, I mean, the the Senna bronze kind of escalated everything a bit 
the the hype from that was crazy. Um, I mean, because because uh, we unveiled the selling bronze at Autosport in January, which I didn't I didn't realize that how clever that actually was because there's nothing else going on in the world of motorsport in January. Right. So it was all everybody was talking about. And it was a little bit busier back in 2019, yeah, yeah, 2020 it, exactly, Autosport. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that went went viral everywhere. I was on Top Gear and the Times. Uh, I was on Breakfast News, on, all, all over the world. I was on Brazilian TV news. It, it was it was crazy. And that that uh, inherently increases demand on the paintings. Inherently, on in hindsight, uh, I didn't actually think of that before. The 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 publicity from that statue increased the interest interest on the paintings. Um, and fundamentally, my pricing always has been uh, supply and demand. Um, obviously, I'm always going to get as much money as I can for what I create, obviously. Um, but that is governed by how fast I can work. If I can only create one painting a week. And certainly for the last five years, I've always had six months of work backed up. So the price does get nudged up until it slows demand. Is the theory, I mean, a simple logic, but the, the best part of that is it's organic and it's for a reason. Whereas if you go, if, if you're a beginner artist, you go, right, I'm creating that, it's 20 grand. Everyone's like, uh, what? <laughs> you know, what? What are you doing? Because there's, there's no reason for it. Um, I've seen some pieces at Podium just for reference for say, I don't know about this, about that big. I don't know what you're probably telling me. What numbers is that? What what frame that, that, is a canvas? That's yeah, two by three foot, what you've just that's done. That's it. I, I really, I love the Lewis Hamilton <laughs> yeah. uh, one. So, I, I'd love that in the, the end piece yeah. of my hall. And something like that would be around about the 1250 mark, was I? Uh, somewhere around, uh, between, yeah, somewhere around that. So, so the ones here are mainly embellished canvases. So they're a, a print with paint on top. So kind of halfway between the print and the original. Um, and at a gallery level, certainly that's our bread and butter. So they they sell for about fifteen hundred quid. So you wouldn't necessarily have painted those by hand every yeah, single yeah, no, one. Yeah, no, I paint all them by hand. Um, but they those take about half an hour each. Wow. Okay. So I'll I'll do um, I'll do maybe four, or six, or eight of those in an afternoon to wake my brain up to painting an oil painting to paint an, an original. I'd have, I'd have never had an idea that that was how it yeah. could have been. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the the reason, the analogy I've always used is if if I go into the studio and I have to start painting, it's the same kind of lethargy as if you're sat on a sofa and you want to go out for a run. It's just like, oh, right. I, I, know, I, I know I need to, but I can't be asked. And then the, the more you overthink it, the less likely you are to do it. But if you go out and just go for a walk, and then start running gently, and then it's the most amazing thing you've ever done. It's exactly the same with painting. It's that the lethargy to get because you know it's going to be taxing. You know you've got to get your brain in a certain zone. So I use embellishing my limited editions as a way to walk warm up my brain through the afternoon to be able to jump into something difficult afterwards. So painting goes on to painting. That's amazing because it's yeah. almost like you're going through the steps of getting to where you need to be. And those steps initially, again, when you actually started painting as a full-time career, because as you said, you were basically made redundant from a job in London that you really loved and yeah. kind of came from the skills that you had when you left yeah. um, education to being thrown in the deep end of the art world. How long did it take you for argument to, to get from where you were there to what you were earning during your job in London? Uh a few months. Wow. No, it, 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 that, that surprised me. I thought my amateur art career was going all right. You know, I was, I was earning a bit of beer money. Uh, I was selling possibly more than a lot of artists on gallery walls already. Um, yeah, I was selling everything that I had time to create. Um, yeah, the price was fairly, the price point was fairly low. Um, but as soon as I focused on it full time, it, it did go bonkers. Um, I didn't realize how much scope there was. And I, I wasn't painting much F1 then. Um, so this is back in 2008, 2009. Um, it was animals, superheroes, Star Wars, that sort of thing. Um, I had a couple of big gallery shows which sold out, which again, right, I need to put the price up. If you sell the gallery show out, you're too cheap. Um, <laughs> logically. 
Um, uh, yeah, so it, all right, it might might have been a year. It might have been a year until I matched my, my salary from from a full time job. That's good going, especially in a career like that in London. And yeah. from then, it's obviously gone up and up and up, as you said, in a bit of a gradual curve. We must ask, how did you actually sell the original Senna statue? Right. So i i made uh, I made a life size statue, bronze statue, uh, two hundred and fifty kilograms, and then I made a sixty percent scale version. That was the one I, I saw. Yeah. So i i I thought the the sixty percent scale version would sell quicker, obviously because it's a much lower price point. Uh, and I was doing the the life size one as the PR, the, you know, the big hit, the, the the famous poster boy that I could then sell the smaller ones off of. Uh, in reality, it worked out completely the other way around. So I I stated that I was going to make three life size statues, and they all sold out a, in two or three weeks. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, that's. <laughs> And how uh, did you take those to market? Was that as an auction? Was that as a price? Did you approach your best customers that you already had? Uh, they're all inquiries dropping in because of uh, the, really? the hype from from the press. Yeah. And did all of those stay in the UK or are they abroad? Uh, well, the first one was bought by McLaren. Wow. Uh, so all through the process, I'd kept Zach Brown uh, informed of what I was doing. Uh, he was always, uh, yeah, fine, love it. We'll promote it. I'd love to love to show it on the boulevard, uh, which again, that's that's incredible for something that I haven't even finished yet. I've only showed them the, the renders of it, and this is what it looked like. Um, but then when uh, we installed it on the boulevard, uh, and then by the he he was in a meeting, so I didn't get to see him at the time. By the time I got home, two hours away, two hours away, um, I had a, an email going, "Okay, how much?" Right. <laughs> and what was the answer to that? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you that. Because uh, uh, Zach Brown, uh, funny enough, is uh, quite a good negotiator. Uh, and he beat me down. He beat me down. And he said, look, I promise you, I need you to come to this price to get it through the board. But I promise you more work off the back of it. Uh, and here we are, uh, four bronze statues later. So I've since... Life, made, life-size ones. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's about a year later that... Um, yeah, just over a year later that Nicky Lauda died um, and Zach immediately commissioned uh, a, a statue of Nicky. Um, so it was literally the day after Nicky Lauda died. So it was Mansour Oje was one of the shareholders of McLaren and him and Zach commissioned a statue of him. During that meeting, it was then discussed, hey, Bruce McLaren died 50 years ago next year. Uh, I think we need to mark that anniversary. Could you create a statue of Bruce? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember him banging the table and just saying, you can do this, right? I'm like, yeah. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> One's just leading on to the next yeah. and the next and yeah. the next. And alongside that, you've got the 60% scaled versions as yeah. well. Yeah. What happened with those? Yeah, they've, they've been steady. So uh, the 60% scale versions, um, uh, it's an addition of 41. Uh, uh, I forget now, but I, I think there's three or four of them left. Um, but here we are, you know, five years later. Um, so they, they've sold steadily, which, which is lucky because, uh, you know, we all take six months to, to make still. Wow. Um, just having the, the model doesn't make it any quicker. So even though there's a foundry with 300 people in yeah. it that you're uh, are still working with, they yeah. take six months to make. I'm, I'm fighting for studio space with Damien Hurst. You know, he, some of the size, for, for example, and, and many others, but, you know, some of the, some of the stuff they have going on there are monumental. So, so it's not six months to make in terms of manufacturing or six months to make in during the process? Sorry, from a point of order, it's, it's right, six months. Okay. Um, manufacturing, it's, it's still several, it's pro- probably a month's work for one or two people to create a new bronze edition. So coming from then the bronzes and the paintings, you've mentioned that you have met Zach Brown, you've come, got to know Zach Brown. He's given yeah. you plenty of work. He's yeah. nearly pushed you over the edge by the sounds yeah. of some of the work he's given you. Yeah. How amazing is it to be able to sell to people that when you are, I'm guessing, admiring motorsport and seeing some of those people, you must have sold to other people in the motorsport world, right? That you just, it's a pinch me moment. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, the, the first first big pinch me with was Jensen Button. 
Um, so I painted his uh, the, the pink helmet that he used to commemorate his father because his dad used to wear um, pink shirts. Yep. Um, so that was in 2014. I was doing a, a gallery show in Singapore for F1 Week and I painted this pink helmeted piece for that show. And that was at the British Embassy and then it was going to the gallery. So I'd already told the British Embassy that I was including a Jensen piece in the collection. Uh, I had the whole collection packed up about to ship it and I had an email off Jensen's PA Jules saying Jensen would like the painting. Right, well, that's obviously going to happen. Um, so, but I then had a problem that I had a show with no Jensen painting, even though they'd promoted it. So I then had to spend, I literally spent 22 hours straight in the studio to create a new Jensen painting overnight, ran to the frame as packed it and then shipped, shipped the replacement out to Singapore just because Jensen wanted the painting. Which is incredible because... How how do you even get in the zone like that? So did you have to do the other smaller paintings, as you said before, to get in the zone to be able to do no, that? Or was you straight into no, that No, I was one? straight into it. Yeah, I, I, I can force myself. Um, it's just not nice. I mean, there's, there's been a couple of projects like that when, um, I mean, I had a, I was commissioned by a Chelsea Football Club to create a piece of the whole team to celebrate their premiership title. And they gave me, I think, 10 days notice before they were unveiling us at the party. And in those 10 days, I also had uh, F1 Monaco week. So <laughs> I literally had, I think, five days to paint 11 faces, um, which, which, you know, it, normally that'll be a month's work, really. 11 faces is, you know, each face takes several days. And I'm guessing um, at the level that you currently are now as well, if it's not right, it doesn't go out. No, exactly. Yeah, there, there, there's no, yeah, there's no second best. They, they can't be because um, especially something at that level, because quite obviously a lot of people are going to see it. You know, that was unveiled in a room of um, 3,000 people for dinner at uh, one of the Battersea Evolution in, in London. Um, yeah, it was import incredibly important to get that right. So I had to paint some of it live. So I had to, um, I had to paint 11 faces fundamentally in five days. I had to put it in the car, drive to the airport, and then I had to do Monaco race week and then fly out of Monaco on the morning of race day. So I missed the race to get back to Chelsea to live paint the rest of this painting on stage. So is every, everything you? Is everything still you? Do you organise your own deliveries? Do you organise everything? Uh, not, what what not has that quite. business become? So, um, I mean, I have a publisher who are amazing. They manage the gallery relationships. Um, they manage the limited editions. Um, I have another printer as well who I've worked with through my whole career, Richard, who's uh, my best mate. And he, he's been literally with me the whole way. Um, but my publisher takes out so much workload. So, I mean, now sitting here, I'm on the way back from Goodwood Revival. I've just done a gallery show at Goodwood Revival. And that gallery show was entirely through my publisher. All I had to do was turn up today, talk for three hours, and then get in the car and drive here. So it, that side of things, it's uh, relieved a lot of pressure. Um, I have my wife working alongside me all the time. Uh, she helps in the studio a bit, uh, helps keep me sane. Um, her father does a lot of the delivery driving. Her mum does some of the packing and cleaning. and Just become a family business. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I mean, at one point, I had five of the family on, on, a, on payroll, you know, it's, it, which is lovely. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole family is working with the businesses. And have you had years where you've enjoyed your painting more than others? Um, no, I, I, I always enjoy painting. Um, right. I always enjoy painting as long as I'm into what I'm painting. Some commissions I've had, yeah, some of the left field commissions um, ugh, that don't mean anything to me. It, it can be tricky to motivate. Um, a lot of oil paintings that I paint now um, are because I've chosen to. I have so much work coming in. I'm really privileged to have more work coming in than I can possibly do. So I do get to pick and choose what I accept um, and what I don't accept. And you don't even have to act that like the beginning anymore. As no, you said. no, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly that. It's uh, it, it's bizarre when you when you think about it, really. 
because I uh, met you at Silverstone in the British Racing Drivers Club. Yeah. And I can't remember. Do you remember how many pieces you had on display? There was a mixture of bronzes oh, and paintings. Over, over 30. It? Yeah. Over 30, 30. And they all sold that weekend. Yeah. yeah. Everything, everything 2D sold. Yeah. Everything on the wall sold. I also saw the same color as that life light on the ceiling in the car park was your stunning orange lamborghini hurricane evo yeah, it's good advertising isn't it it's good advertising <laughs> yeah. you've got to have it in a bright color to be fair that's yeah awesome it, it's uh how did that come about for you and was that a real pinch me moment that you got to that point uh yeah for sure uh i mean it it, it it's been a side benefit of working with these brands um alongside mclaren i have a good relationship with lamborghini um, I have a more tentative relationship with Ferrari. They're a bit more protective of their brand, but uh, with Lamborghini, they commissioned me to create a, a bronze bull for their 60th, which was this year. So that was really cool. They then showed it at their 60th celebrations in uh, at Tilston. Um, so again, it, it it it's just come from creating artwork around everything that I love. Um, I first met the uh, Lamborghini brand manager and he was like, oh, Paul, I'm a big fan of yours. And I'm like, damn right. it, he's going to order something. <laughs> Literally, my, my next comment was, well, this is all great, but this conversation is going to cost me a lot more money than it's going to cost you. I, I, I'm very sure of that. And that's, that's come to pass. So, uh, but yeah, that orange Lambo. Um, so I've, I've had, uh, had a couple now over the last few years, but um, that one's my forever car now. It's in the custom orange. So that was a, a genuine paint to sample. I literally painted a coloured swatch. Because they're like, oh no, we got bright oranges. I'm like, nah, not really. Not really. And I painted the sample. I said, look, paint me this. And then you know, a year and a half later, out out pops her. And I bet any money that the guy that handed that car over to you was so worried until you'd w- walked around it to make sure that everything it, was perfect more than any other customer yeah, ever. Yeah. Because uh, I'm I'm planning to keep that forever. Because uh, that was because, my next question. Yeah, for, for one, it, it's my custom color, um, and and, it, and it's stunning. But but also because it's uh, naturally aspirated V10. They yeah they they, they don't make those anymore. I'm so. lucky enough to have a Performante Spider. Yeah. Um. So I get what you're on about. They, they um yeah they, they scream a bit, don't they? They are a little bit special. It's just, it's not just that. It's just the way they go around corners. Well, it's like it's a go just... kart. It's like a go kart with a rocket up its ass. It's uh. I've never quite got into the McLarens. I'm not gonna. Um, Mine fell to bits. I, yeah, it uh, did. It fell to bits. The so, one I had. Right. Some of them are spectacular. Uh, I had a 765 LT for a week. Uh, that's mental. Absolutely mental. Uh, I mean, it still tries to get away from you in fourth. You know, it, it's it's that fast, but they they they're they're improving. I, I really like the current McLarens. Um, one day. One day. I rarely meet any business owner that hasn't had their fair share of challenges along the way since the start. What would you say has been a favourite year along the way and what has been the most challenging? Uh, fav- favourite year? I mean, if, if you're doing it right, it should every year should be your favourite year, shouldn't it? It's like the same as my favourite piece. It should always be the last one I've painted. Um, if you're doing it right, uh, 2019, I, I guess, uh, it, it was incredible when, when I unveiled the center statue and the whole of that year was spent, I hardly painted anything cause I was traveling, um, traveling to events and, uh, that was phenomenal. Um, least favorite apart from the obvious, I'm hesitating to, to blame COVID, um, because that was. It, it, again, in a weird way, it turned out all right um, because you know the the world stopped for everybody, but but for us, I we just kept on working. Um, you know, I had the demand still dropped in. Um, I didn't have all the travel that I'd normally have. I didn't have all the events that I'd normally have, which made it far less stressful. In the end, I mean, okay. When when I shit at the fan, I'd, I'd shit myself because it was like, right, who the hell is going to buy a luxury item when there's a worldwide pandemic? Uh, turns out quite a few people. But um, I think I think fundamentally there are a lot of uh, very successful people who don't normally have time to think about that blank space they got on the wall. Well, with a pandemic, it's like, ah, 
we need to fill that. Oh, I know, I've seen this guy. You know, but because I had a brand and a presence, they came to me. It so it turned out all right. But um, so now I'd, I I've loved every minute of being a full time artist. It, it, You've it, never it, had a moment where you thought I can't do this anymore. God, oh God no. no, God no, no. The passion's still there, just yeah, it like was, it was. I mean, you you get your hard moments. I mean, you know, it, it's especially for stress. Um, because, um, I mean, what, what brings about stress are deadlines and I get a hell of a lot of deadlines. You know, they're not going to move an F1 race because I'm not ready for it. They're not going to change a car unveiling because I'm not ready with whatever they've asked me to create for it. Um, so deadlines create pressure. Um, creatively, I'm usually okay. I can create fine under pressure, but it, but we've always got a finite amount of time. Um, and then being pulled in every direction, because when the the biggest challenge uh, is is when things gain their own momentum, is to keep moving in the right direction, because momentum can take you off to the side very very easily if you don't focus on where you're going. And where are you going? Where's the next steps of Paul? Well, Lars? yeah, turn to, to now on his head. I'd, as long as it's forwards, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing so You don't set yourself, uh, say, t- targets no, anymore, no, you, business no, plans, no, as you I've, said, funnels, no, all the rest of no, it. I've, no, exactly. I, uh, my only business plan is earn, earn more than I spend. You know, it, it's, it, I don't think in what I do, you can analyze it too minutely because it's too unpredictable. Um, I could create something tomorrow and nobody wants it. Or I could create the same thing and everybody wants it. I don't know. Uh, I, okay, I, I have a good idea which way that's going to go, but um, you're a bit more confident now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah but exactly. But um, you 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 can't you can't predict it. Sometimes um, things are a lot slower than than I expect, and then other times things are a lot faster than I expect. So, oh, it's been amazing to hear your story. It's been amazing to hear what goes into it. We've learned plenty along the way, and I appreciate coming to talk to me today. It's All a ours. pleasure. Thank you so much. And just like you said about when you met that brand manager at Lamborghini, I've now spoke to you for 45 minutes and I'm surrounded by your artwork for sale. So if I don't leave with a a piece today, I'm going to be very surprised. Sorry, that happens. Pleasure to meet you. (laughs) Thank Thank you, you. Cheers.